Hello there and welcome to a video. Today we're going to be looking at the hidden lesbian themes in Coraline. I've been a fan of Coraline for years and I had no idea about any of the hidden lesbian aspects. So when I heard the revelation that it featured a canon lesbian couple, I began researching it and couldn't believe I'd missed so many carefully integrated clues in both the book and film underscoring the lesbian relationship. Of course, Coraline revolves around themes of deception and illusion, so it's appropriate that the lesbian relationship would be represented through clues and symbolism, discernible to those who cared to look beyond the surface. Once you start to deconstruct the book and film through a lesbian lens, it's really quite fascinating just how layered and meticulous the lesbian themes in Coraline are. Before we begin, I'd just like to say a quick thank you to my members on Ko-Fi for supporting this content and supplying me with coffee, which is how these videos get made. Well, that and naked women standing in a circle in the woods, manifesting them. Anyway, me and my mushkos appreciate the support. So, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Coraline, but if you're not, it's a novel written by Neil Gaiman about a young girl who discovers an idolised alternate universe behind a secret door in her new home. She enjoys this discovery until she soon realises that all is not what it seems and must use her resources and bravery to save both herself and her family from the sinister clutches of the Bell Dam. The novel, which was released in 2002, was also adapted into a stop-motion film in 2009, and I will be discussing the hidden lesbian themes in both the book and the film in this video. Now, the characters of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible are often misinterpreted as either sisters or friends, but in fact are a canon lesbian couple. And we know this because it has been confirmed more than once by the creator of Coraline, Neil Gaiman, on his social media. Furthermore, they're based on a real life lesbian couple that Gaiman knew. And it's important to understand that he wrote the characters of April Spink and Miriam Forcible and their interactions with each other from the viewpoint that they were in a relationship with each other. And it's important to acknowledge this before we look at the lesbian themes in the book and film because whilst everything in art is up for interpretation, that knowledge factors into the type of interpretations that can be made and their validity. Right, so let's start by looking at the hidden lesbian elements in the book. So, we're introduced to the characters of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible near the beginning of the novel, and they are described as follows. Miss Spink and Miss Forcible lived in the flat below Coraline's, on the ground floor. They were both old and round, and they lived in their flat with a number of ageing Highland Terriers, who had names like Hamish and Andrew and Jock. Once upon a time, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible had been actresses. As Miss Spink told Coraline the first time she met her, you see Caroline, Miss Spink said, getting Coraline's name wrong. Both myself and Miss Forcible were famous actresses in our time. We trod the boards, lovey. Oh, don't let Hamish eat the fruitcake or he'll be up all night with his tummy. This passage tells us quite a lot about the characters of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible and their relationship with one another. They're two older women who are referred to as Miss, which tells us they're not married to men and they have different surnames. So we can presume, since they're not married, they're also not related. It's worth noting here that gay marriage wasn't legal when this book was written. So even as a long-time lesbian couple, they still would have been referred to as Miss and not Miss. Misses. And of course, they are also living together with a number of dogs, which mirrors a lot of gay and lesbian couples in real life who will often adopt cats or dogs, as opposed to having children, particularly historically, since there wasn't as many options or support for gay and lesbian couples to become a family as there are today, making the older gay couple with a fur baby family somewhat of a stereotype. And one which is true at least for the real lesbian couple that Miss Spink and Miss Forcible, who Gaiman has described as having multiple terriers, are based upon. Who would have thought that a real life lesbian couple would be so lesbian 
coded. What's the connection? We're also introduced to the fact that Miss Spink and Miss Forcible used to work as actresses and from the line, we trod the boards lovey, we know they worked in theatre, which of course makes them thespians. There's the obvious syllabic and rhyming connection between the word thespian and lesbian, which works well as an inside joke. And their past theatrical profession also links to the rich real-life history of homosexuals abounding in the theatre due to it being an environment that is largely liberal and progressive. Of course, the characters were based off of actual retired actresses, who also just happened to be a lesbian couple. So whilst the theatrical elements were not a conscious artistic choice within the context of creating lesbian coded characters. The associations are interesting and worth mentioning in relation to lesbian themes anyway. Moving on, the next part of the book which stood out to me in terms of lesbian implications is the part where Miss Spink is telling Coraline about how in her days as an actress men used to send flowers to her dressing room. It reads, they used to send flowers to my dressing room. They did, she said. Who did? asked Coraline. Miss Spink looked around cautiously, looking over first one shoulder and then over the other, peering into the mists as though someone might be listening. Men, she whispered. Then she tugged the dogs to heel and waddled off back towards the house. And what's telling about this dialogue is the fact she feels the need to say it as though it's a secret, which implies that she thinks of romantic male attention as something that's potentially taboo or distasteful. And interestingly, her attitude here mirrors that of the way society, particularly historically, treated the idea of same-sex attraction. So Miss Spink's attitude can be interpreted as an inversion of heteronormativity, which is a big clue as to who she is. Her cautiousness could also be interpreted as her not wanting Miss Forcible to overhear about this past male attention in case of potential jealousy. Or it could even point to her having a secret history with men that she'd rather other people not know about. Although she only mentions attention as opposed to interaction, so that's a weaker theory but nonetheless there's multiple ways of interpreting her behaviour through a lesbian lens in this passage. I think it's interesting Neil Gaiman uses Miss Spink's attitude towards men as a signifier of her lesbianism. It's a very male thing to relate lesbianism to a disdain of men or to establish a lesbian character through how she relates to men, which in both cases keeps lesbianism anchored to men. And you see this time and time again in lesbian media or in lesbian characters made by male creators. And that's not to imply that Neil Gaiman is necessarily ignorant of this. He did have to get creative when it came to the lesbian implications in this book. So it's not necessarily a criticism, rather just an observation. The next passage of the book which stood out to me in terms of April and Miriam's relationship is when Coraline goes to visit them at their flat and witnesses the way the two of them interact. It reads, Now Miriam, we agreed, said Miss Spink. Coraline wondered if they'd forgotten she was there. They weren't making much sense. She decided they were having an argument as old and comfortable as an armchair. The kind of argument that no one ever really wins or loses, but which can go on forever if both parties are willing. The way that Coraline perceives their bickering and describes it as old and comfortable as an armchair implies she recognises a deep familiarity and a sense of comfort between the two of them. This playful back and forth dynamic is often portrayed between older heterosexual married couples in film and television and is a recognisable trait in romantic relationships. The fact that Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's interactions mirror this is certainly a clue to the true nature of their connection. There's also the consideration of the elements of mysticism incorporated with April and Miriam's characters. And this is potentially another clue to their lesbianism because mysticism has associations with homosexuality due to the both of them being antithetical to religious dogma and their associations with otherness. 
That said, the mysticism element of their characters signifying their lesbianism is one of the weaker interpretations you could make in the novel and may have just been included for plot purposes, but still worth considering nonetheless. Another notable part of the book is when Miss Spink mentions that her and Miss Forcible are going to be staying with her niece, which further underscores their inseparableness. And it also links into the familiar stereotype of the childless lesbian aunts, which means we can add yet another stamp to the lesbian stereotypes bingo card for these two. The next part of the book, which contains a wealth of clues about Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's relationship, is when Coraline visits the other world and enters their flat, which she finds has been turned into a theatre where the other Miss Spink and Miss Forcible are putting on a performance. It reads, Miss Forcible and Miss Spink were doing some acting. Miss Forcible was sitting on a stepladder. Miss Spink was standing at the bottom. What's in a name? asked Miss Forcible. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Have you got any more chocolates? said the dog. Coraline gave the dog another chocolate. I know not how to tell thee who I am, said Miss Spink to Miss Forcible. This bit finishes soon, whispered the dog. Then they start folk dancing. How long does this go on for? asked Coraline. The theatre. All the time, said the dog forever and always. So the first notable thing from this passage is that the other April and Miriam are reenacting a scene from Romeo and Juliet, which as I'm sure most of you all already know, is a play which revolves around star-crossed lovers. By having the other April and Miriam recite the lines of these star-crossed lovers, and have their position on the stepladder mirror the iconic positions from which Romeo and Juliet converse from in Act 2, Scene 2. It creates a romantic parallel and forms the connection between the idea of them as lovers too. Then Miss Spink says the line, I know not how to tell thee who I am, which is a line also taken from Act 2, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet can be interpreted as having been included by Neil Gaiman to serve as a double expression in which he is conveying to the reader that he doesn't know how to tell them who Miss Spink really is or that there's an extra element to that character that the reader is perhaps not aware of. After that, Coraline asks how long does this go on for in reference to the theatrics and the dog replies with all the time and forever and always. Forever and always is a commonly used phrase to express commitment and enduring love and the dog using that phrase in reference to April and Miriam carries clear romantic connotations. And the final part of the novel which offers clues about the lesbian relationship is when Coraline finds the other April and Miriam intertwined in a sack. It reads... The creature in the sack seemed horribly unformed and unfinished, as if two plasticine people had been warmed and rolled together, squashed and pressed into one thing. At first nothing happened. It was held tight in the creature's grasp. Then, one by one, fingers loosened their grip and the marble slipped into her hand. She pulled her arm back through the sticky webbing, relieved that the thing's eyes had not opened. She shone the light on its faces. They resembled, she decided, the younger versions of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible, but twisted and squeezed together, like two lumps of wax that had melted and melded together into one ghastly thing. Coraline finding the other Miss Spink and Miss Forcible melded and intertwined in this way is a physical representation how close these two characters truly are. In fact, they're so close they've become one thing, as it is described in the book, which evokes the notion of two people becoming one, a notion which is typically associated with romantic love. And the phrase to become one is also most commonly used in relation to romantic relationships. So Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's physical melding carries those romantic connotations. And this part of the book is horrifying, of course, so it's easy to miss the lesbian implications with everything else going on, since it's overshadowed by the horror elements, but even still, there's a glaringly obvious meaning behind the way that the other Miss Forcible and Miss Spink are portrayed in this part of the book. 
they really couldn't be any closer. So deconstructing the lesbian themes and the characterization of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible in the novel, we can see how there's a clear and consistent implication as to who they really are and what the true nature of their relationship is, with Neil Gaiman creatively utilizing metaphors and symbolism to portray the depth of their connection. The absence of a direct confirmation of a lesbian relationship in the novel allows for the reader to either recognize or dismiss the lesbian elements in it as they choose. Neil Gaiman, what a creative chap. Maybe he should try and make a career out of being creative or something, I, I don't know. Now, moving on to the film. A lot of the lesbian themes and clues about April and Miriam's characters and relationship are very similar to what's in the book, however the film has the added benefit of being a visual production, and therefore has more artistic freedom to create symbolism and metaphors about lesbianism in its own unique way. The visual factor means the film's portrayal of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's relationship is different to, yet equally as interesting, as the novel. So the first hint in relation to the lesbian relationship in the film that I noticed is the way Coraline's mum, Melinda Jones, refers to Miss Spink and Miss Forcible when she's talking to Coraline. She refers to them as those slight pause and then with some emphasis, actresses. The pause is intentional and implies that she's thinking about what to refer to April and Miriam as, in a way which mirrors how some parents might pause when thinking of how to refer to gay and lesbian couples around children. The emphasis on the word actresses in particular felt sarcastic and informed. However, this is just one interpretation of her tone here and since Melinda Jones as a character is perpetually unimpressed with everything and everyone in the film, it may just have been an extension of that. But it still stood out to me as a potential clue about Miss Forcible and Miss Spink's relationship, so I wanted to mention it anyway. Then we have the scene where Coraline goes to visit Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's flat, which is where we're first introduced to them as characters in the film. And a lot of the lesbian themes and clues in this scene are similar to what's in the book. However, as I mentioned, the film has the added benefit of being a visual production, which means it's able to build upon their characterization and relationship through visual clues and aesthetic choices. So we're shown that April and Miriam have a history of working in the theatre, we're shown that they own a multitude of dogs together, we're shown that there's a comfortable domesticity between them, and we're shown that they have an interest in mysticism, all of which I've already explained the relevance of in relation to lesbianism and their relationship with each other when talking about the novel, so I won't go over it again here, it's very much the same messaging, just in different packaging. But all of these visuals tell you so much about who they are, without the characters having to verbalise anything about themselves or their relationship at all. An interesting observation about the film's visual characterization of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible is the way that, from the posters inside of their flat, we can see that the film has taken the lesbian and theatrical elements of their characters from the source material and made a conscious artistic choice to reshape those elements into something much more adult. Both of these posters are very reminiscent of adult film and the hypersexualization of lesbianism for the male gaze, which reinforces the point I made earlier about male creators anchoring lesbianism to men. However, where the book uses men as a tool to convey lesbianism, the film frames it as a performance for the benefit of men and male sexuality, which is disturbing but again not particularly surprising considering the film was crafted through a male lens. Crudeness aside, the image of April and Miriam with interlacing fingers on the King Lear poster is a small detail which implies a physical intimacy and familiarity between the two of them, and it's a small detail which is reproduced later on in the film, when Coraline finds the other Miss Spink and Miss Forcible holding hands with interlacing fingers inside of a sack. 
And we'll get to the significance of that scene later on, but I thought it was a very cool visual connection. One thing that the film employs as a representation of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's lesbianism, which the book doesn't, is marine symbolism. Now, marine life is often associated with lesbianism and in fact is often utilised in lesbian media as a signifier for lesbian desire because there's a prominent connection between female anatomy and and various types of marine life, be that by a visual likeness or by scent. So by including marine visuals in Miss Spink and Miss Forcible scenes, there's the suggestion that these women take an interest in female anatomy. I know that might sound a little crude and adult, but this film does have a crude and adult sense of humour peppered throughout it, so it is fitting. An interesting visual clue about April and Miriam's relationship that appears in the scene where Coraline visits their flat is in the cards that are laid out upon the table. There's four piles of cards and two of these piles have a card turned upright. The first of these two cards is the five of hearts and the second is the four of spades. These cards hold different meanings within the context of cartomancy and cartomancy is fortune telling or divination using a deck of cards, which again connects to the elements of mysticism intertwined with Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's characters. Anyway, both of these cards hold a meaning which is thoughtfully connected to the characters sat at the table, Coraline and Miss Spink. In cartomancy, the five of hearts represents marriage and signifies a relationship on the right track. And this card can only be applicable to Miss Spink since Coraline is a child and since Miss Forcible is the most significant relationship in Miss Spink's life. The card is a clue about the true nature of their relationship. It's worth reiterating here that gay marriage wasn't legal when Coraline was released, yet the card still signifies that their relationship is a marriage nonetheless. Then we have the Four of Spades, and in Cartomancy, the Four of Spades is related to reality and the mundane. It represents the way we go about our day-to-day -day lives, the struggles that we endure, our interpersonal relationships, and the way we connect to the world around us. This card is obviously relevant to Coraline's character, particularly at this point in the film where she's feeling a lot of frustration about her seemingly mundane reality and the relationship that she has with her parents. And the inclusion of these cards in this scene is nothing short of genius. Coraline's character is a little off topic from the lesbian themes, but still. The cards have to be my favourite visual clue in the entire film. The next scene which is relevant to the lesbian themes in the film, much in the same way as the book, is when Coraline visits the other April and other Miriam's flat in the other world and finds it has been turned into a theatre. This scene is where the marine symbolism I discussed earlier in relation to lesbianism becomes rather overt. The musical number is performed against a nautical backdrop, Miss Spink is dressed as a mermaid, there's the inclusion of oyster and clam decor and props, and Miss Forcible is adorning a ring which has a pearl protruding from an oyster shell. So this scene is packed with symbolism revolving around female anatomy and lesbianism. However, what struck me the most about this scene, and I can't believe I never picked up on this before, is the stark parallels between it and the book and television series Tipping the Velvet. These parallels include the utilisation of marine life as a signifier for lesbianism, the backdrop and associations of the theatre and even the iconic image of the single red rose being chucked through the air and caught. The Tipping the Velvet book came out in 1998 and the television series came out in 2002, which was during the time when the Coraline novel was first published and the ideas for the film adaptation were being put into motion. You will notice the Coraline novel doesn't mention marine life at all, so its inclusion in the film adaptation was a deliberate artistic choice and the film's parallels with Tipping the Velvet could all be a coincidence, but considering the timing between the two productions and the lesbian elements, it's likely that Tipping the Velvet did have some influence on it. And then, similar to the book, the film presents a 
physical representation of how close Miss Spink and Miss Forcible truly are. In the scene where Coraline finds the other Miss Spink and other Miss Forcible intertwined in some kind of sack. However, the film has added in an extra detail to their intertwinement, which is their interlaced fingers. The way that they're holding hands is reminiscent of the way lovers often hold hands. So this small detail of interlacing fingers adds a further romantic implication about their connection in this scene. Ladies, is it gay to be intertwined with another woman inside of a creepy sack, asking for a friend? The pearl ring is also an artistic choice which differs from the book, where it is instead described as a glass marble. And knowing that the pearl symbolises female anatomy and sexuality, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible holding it between the both of them is a representation of their love of the female form, and therefore of each other. Much like in the book, this scene is horrifying, so it's easy to miss a lot of the lesbian implications and clues due to the overshadowing horror elements. But when you take the time to analyse this scene, you can see just how overt the lesbian themes are in it. The final visual clue in relation to April and Miriam's relationship in the film is the red tulips in the ending scene. Red tulips represent everlasting love and are a symbol of deep affection. So April handing Miriam a red tulip, which is a romantic gesture in itself, signifies a deep love between the two of them. Tulips in general also represent rebirth and new beginnings, which has a wider relevance to this scene because of course, Coraline is entering the next chapter of her life with a fresh perspective and more positive outlook after her experience with the Bell Dam. And they don't hold back with the tulip symbolism in this scene. They do not. So, examining the lesbian themes in the film, we can see how the implementation of lesbianism is different to that of the novel. And in a lot of ways, the visual factor in the film allows for a much more creative and overt trail of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's relationship compared to the textual confines of the book. That said, both productions are still incredibly interesting to deconstruct in their own unique way. And that's about all the lesbian themes and clues I was able to pick up on in the book and film. I hope I covered everything, but the film in particular is so artistically intricate, I wouldn't be surprised if there's one or two things that I've missed. Of course, I'm not ignorant of the insidious implications behind portraying a lesbian relationship through suggestion, which people can choose to ignore instead of having to acknowledge it for what it is, largely due to the notion that a lesbian relationship is not appropriate for children's media and homophobic parents wanting to shield their innocent children from gay corruption. Of course, that's tiresome and cowardly, but nonetheless, was and still sadly is the predominant line of thought when it comes to marketing children's media. That said, I'm also not naive to the fact that for the film and book to have been more overt about the lesbian relationship would have had consequences, and so it's understandable why they would take that approach, and whilst it's important to acknowledge the homophobic implications, the creators don't deserve to be raked across the coals for working within the confines of the intersection between capitalism and homophobia. As a silver lining, the creative clues which point to the lesbianism in Coraline simply just one more fascinating layer to this production, which makes it so interesting and fun to deconstruct. Okay, thanks for watching everyone. If you have any observations, theories, or anything to add to this video at all, I'd love to read them down in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to stay here with me on this channel forever, all you need to do is allow me to sew these buttons into your eyes. The subscribe button, that is. It won't hurt a bit.